If you'll give me just a few minutes, I, uh, I'm beginning something today that I will not exhaust today. It's going to take me a few weeks uh, to work my way through. I was in um, Atlanta. I stopped in Atlanta on my way home to preach for a statewide camp meeting on Friday. I got there late Thursday night in Atlanta, just went to my hotel room and stayed the whole day. Shut up. The Lord had just said to me, he said, I want you just to shut yourself in. So I told Ashton, I said, just don't worry about me today. I'm here. I'm just going to be in my room. He brought me a little bit of lunch into my room. And while I was there, I had a major visitation from God that I feel like was like a remantling of something in my life personally. But I believe it was a divine instruction for the life of this house. You know, there's a principle I learned many years ago called the, the principle of holy discontentment. Holy discontentment. And it basically says this, that whatever, whatever causes you the greatest agitation is probably an indication of your greatest place of assignment. Whatever frustrates you most could very well be something you've been called to do. It's how you know. It won't leave you alone. And my greatest frustration in my life, I believe without exception, is people that profess to be followers of Christ and have no evidence of it in their life. In other words, there's no fruit. Jesus didn't say you'll be known by what you say. He said you'll be known by your fruit. I continue to be amazed how many times people will say, well, I'm, I'm growing in Christ, but they have no way to measure it. How do you tell? Because in reality, they still struggle with the same habitual sin. They're still struggling with consistency. Have never yet learned to be faithful. Their relationship and walk with God is up and down based on the emotional environment in which they're in in the moment. Still no evidence of willingness to give their life away because there's no serving the kingdom anywhere. Basically, we've become consumers. We come get our blessing. I also have studied enough to know that everybody that preaches the gospel preaches it from an altar that has been touched by God. Whatever touched your life the greatest is going to be the filters through which you see the word primarily. And I realize that some people, the emphasis of the gospel for them is liberation. That Jesus came to open prison doors, set captives free deliverance, freedom, breaking bondages. That's a part of the gospel. For other people, I realize that they preach the gospel from a position of motivation. They want to motivate people. They want to build people's faith, encourage people, let's go do it. We can do it. You can do it. That's a part of the gospel. If I'm going to, if I'm going to preach the whole gospel of Christ to this church, then I'm going to preach liberation. I'm going to preach motivation. But the thing that burns on the altar of my life, for me, it's transformation. Because I saw a lot of people that got free from demons and went on back to the same old lifestyle. And while they enjoyed momentary freedom, they weren't changed. And if I understand anything about the focus of the cross and the focus of the resurrection and the focus of the day which we celebrate today, which is Pentecost, the focus of all of those events was transformed lives. Not good preaching, not great worship songs. The focus of it was so lives could be transformed. Jesus did not come 
to bring behavior modification. Jesus didn't die so that bad people would become better people. He died and rose from the dead so that dead people could become alive. Pentecost means 50. Penty, five. Pentecost is 50. 50 days after the Passover out of Egypt, Moses went up on the mountain to get the law of God because God was giving his people instruction on how to live as his people. Because God was not going to allow his people to live in the world without a distinction upon their life. He meant for them to have evidence that they were the people of God. So Moses went up on the mountain to get the law of God. And while the finger of God was writing in the stone, Moses understood that the people at the bottom of the mountain, how many of you know he'd only been gone a matter of days and they already had gone back to Egypt in their worship? Come on. They were only out of Egypt a matter of days and they resorted back to idolatry. They resorted back to old ways. And Moses comes down off the mountain and he's frustrated as a leader. He's saying, my God, God just opened the Red Sea for you. God just brought you out of 400 years of slavery. God just changed your diet. God just gave you the possibility of a life you've never had. And I can't be gone 48 hours from you guys. And you're back to where you were. And in his frustration, he melts down their idol, their golden calf. And he makes them drink it. And that day in the wrath of God, 3,000 people die. Fast forward now, several thousand years. Jesus, who's coming as the true Passover lamb, comes as the representation of all that God is. Because God will never let the story end on a bad note. God is never going to let the end of the story be. He couldn't fix it. So Jesus comes as the Passover lamb. He goes to the cross and fulfills what had been done by lambs for thousands of years. He goes to a grave. He borrows it for three days. He he rises from the dead. And then for 40 days, he teaches them about things concerning the kingdom He leaves, and for 10 days, they wait for Pentecost. Pentecost. And in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come. In other words, they reached the point on the calendar of the festivals that it was Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost fully comes, watch this. God does exactly again what he did thousands of years earlier with Moses. Only this time he does it different. The prophet Jeremiah and Ezekiel had foretold what would happen that day. Here's what God said. He said, there's coming a day when I will not write my laws on stony tablets. I'm going to write my laws on fleshly hearts. See, I'm going to say some really bold things in this series of messages, so just hold on to your seat. Because see, the reality to me is I don't care whether whether we put the Ten Commandments in front of the state capitol. Who cares if they're in front of the state capitol if they're not on your heart? Because the laws of God are not something to view. They're something to live. He said, there's coming a day, I'm not going to write my laws on stony tablets. I'm going to write my laws on fleshly hearts. And the reason I'm going to write my laws on fleshly hearts, and the reason you're going to be able to keep the law rather than always break it, is because my spirit will not just be on you, my spirit is going to come to indwell you. And in Acts chapter 2, on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes in power. And watch this. Peter stands up and preaches. And what? Don't don't miss this. And 3,000 get saved. 3,000 had died when the power of God was trying to be lived out through the works of the flesh. When people tried to live the kingdom through religious laws, 
3,000 people died. But when the Holy Spirit came in power, 3,000 people lived. I am trying to help somebody today because the truth is in the 21st century, the church world in the Western world in America is still trying to live at the wrong tree. We are still trying to live at the tree of right and wrong, life and death. It can I do this? Can I not do this? Can I smoke and drink if I'm a Christian? Can I do this? Can I go there? Can I live with my girlfriend? Will God let me go to heaven if I die? Because we want to live at the tree of morality that is empowered by mortality rather than living at the tree of life that is empowered by an indwelling God who enables me to do what I could never do on my own. So we tend to believe that if I get better in my behavior, I'm probably a Christian. No, you might be twice the devil you were before. Because now not only do you not misbehave, you're self-righteous. And you believe it's by your disciplines and the gritting of your teeth that somehow you've kept yourself pure. When in reality, God says life comes through the tree of life. You've got to eat of Christ, and you do that by the Spirit. Romans 8, verse number 2 says this. There's two laws that exist. One is the law of sin and death, and the other one is the law of life that comes by the Spirit. The only way you enjoy life is by the Holy Ghost. I'm going somewhere today. Somebody's going to help me. See, historically, our churches have been experientially rich. Churches like ours, we've had a lot of experiences. We've we've experienced the grace of God, the power of God, the goodness of God. But we've been theologically poor. As long as somebody had a B3 Hammond or a great worship leader, we were in the spirit. We just know what we didn't know what to do on Thursday when all hell was breaking loose in the kitchen. Because we didn't have a theology for the fact that the Holy Spirit is with me all the time. Come on, let me let me let me just find out today. How many how many people in the room? Please don't be embarrassed in any way. I'm not I'm not saying anything because I was I was I got family that's a part of this same thing. How many people in this in the room? At some point in time in your life, you were a part of a religious experience that taught you that the activities of the Book of Acts and the things that happened in the Book of Acts, speaking in tongues, miracles, healings, are things that passed and took place in a previous time. Let me see your hand wherever you are, all over the building, all over the building. Because watch this. Too many people have developed their belief system from something people told them and not necessarily from the Bible. And I'm not going after anything other than to say this. Most of it is propagated by denominational organizations that are trying to prop themselves up and keep themselves alive, which God, I believe, is going to tear apart. I don't believe that they'll end. I just believe we're not going to live for them. They're going to be brought down, and the kingdom is going to begin to be advanced. Hallelujah. That's just my passing. But here, here's what I do know. I want to say this boldly for this house. This church, we are what theologians would call continuationist. Continuationist. The people that believe that those things don't happen anymore They believe in cessationism. They believe that it ceased. It no longer exists. We don't believe that the things of the Bible ceased, and now we study them like a museum. We believe that he is a continuation God, and that what he did in the book of Acts, he is still doing today. He's still healing. He's still delivering. He's still casting out devils. He's still bringing people back to life. He's still working miracles. People are still prophesying. Folks are still preaching in tongues. I wish I had some help, because the Holy Spirit is active and alive and working in the church today today 
And when the, listen, when the working of the Holy Spirit and power, that's my point, and power is diminished in the life of the church, the reach of the church will be diminished. When God is no longer the major attraction, When people leave talking about worship teams more than the presence they were in. When people talk more about the preacher than the voice they heard. We begin to diminish the reach of the church because listen, ladies and gentlemen, the reach of the church has no limitations. There are no barriers the church cannot overcome. Please don't, please don't try to tell me that the church is out of date and old fogies and it can't happen in the 21st century. I'm telling you, listen, the reach of the church can reach a blind beggar named Bartimaeus sitting on the side of the road, or it can cause a rich man named Zacchaeus to climb a tree to try to meet Jesus when Jesus becomes the major attraction. I refuse to buy a lie that says we live in a generation that is not interested in meeting the true and living God. In fact, I believe it's just the opposite. I believe we have a generation that is very spiritual. They just don't know what spirit to find. That's why the church is here. We have to awaken them to the power of the living God. I listen to people talk who have prayed their entire life and never seen a prayer answered. It's time for the Holy Ghost and power. See, I, I've experienced things in my lifetime when God came in power and it didn't matter whether you were an executive banker or you were a drug dealer. Your life was impacted. Because the Holy Spirit didn't impress with your title or your position. And your heart can't resist him. But when he's not present, we resort to everything else to attract people. Can I tell you something? Thank God for all the stuff we have. I'm grateful for our media team. They work very, very hard because we, we want to just be as relevant as we can be. But I want to tell you something. These lights have never saved anybody. I ain't got no help. The smoke machine has never saved nobody. Not one drug addict ever left here going, man, I got in that smoke and I got delivered from my crack addict. I am... Wow, glory to God. It ain't, it ain't done nothing. All it does is set a stage. But if we don't have the man, <laughs> if we don't have the man walk out here on the stage, everybody's going to go home just like they came. Because Tony can't change nobody. Ashley can't change nobody. Pianos can't change nobody. But when the Holy Ghost and power begins to move into the midst of people, lives are transformed. I wish somebody would just shout for me. I'm not interested in giving you today my opinion. Because my opinion is no better than your opinion. But I do want to take a minute and walk through the word. At least begin to lay a, 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 a platform for where I'm going. I believe that God is awakening another Holy Spirit wave of glory, but a wave of power in our generation. I stood in secular Europe and I recognized as I talked to a room full of pastors, I said, we will never out debate secularism. You will never out debate humanism. Quit getting in arguments with people at work over Bible and church stuff. 
Quit arguing with them over how you're supposed to sing songs and whether or not you're supposed to have drums and whether or not you gotta wear a tie to church. Quit all the foolish arguments and old wives' tales and myths that came out of people. Here's what I know. If you and I will live in power, if power will show up in your office and the next time somebody comes in and says, I've been to the doctor and got a bad report, I got diabetes, and you say to them, you know what, I'm gonna pray for you tonight and God is going to touch your life and all of a sudden they're healed. You won't have to have a church argument. Because a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. When you just say, I don't know how it happened. I was blind, now I see. Now, how many of you know, how many of you believe, watch this. If this was my last sermon, and when I finish today, I just sort of floated off into heaven. Just while you was watching, I just floated off into heaven. I mean, I'm sure it would be a big band fair. I, I, at least not what I see in my mind anyway. They're gonna blow trumpets and <laughs> Harps are going to play and angels are going to sing. I don't know if that's true or not, but anyway, I, I got it in my head and leave me to my own imagination. But anyway, but if I, if I was preaching and I finished and then I just floated away, how many of you believe you'd remember that? Hmm? See, there's something about a person's last words that you never forget. I was privileged to be with my dad, who was my hero. I was privileged to be with him when he was dying. And I took my phone out and put it on record. And I just asked my dad to talk to me about his life. Things that meant the most. You know what, he didn't talk to me about any disappointments with people. He talked to me about the goodness of God, how God helped him in the midst of his struggles. He wanted to sing because last words tend to be remembered. Well, all the gospel writers made sure we got Jesus's last sermon. This is after the resurrection. Let's look at them quickly. Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. If you guys will put those verses up for me. Hello. There we go. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Then Jesus said to them, this is his last words. So wherever you go in the world, somebody help me, let's, let's read out loud. Tell, say it again. Okay, hold on, we're gonna, we're gonna, we have an altar call right there. We have an altar call right there. Who are you telling? Well, I told my aunt about my doctor's meeting. I told my friends at work about my car breaking down. Jesus said, when you go everywhere, here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell everybody. Tell everybody about good news. Good news. Next verse. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. These are the miraculous signs. In other words, these are the evidence that's gonna begin to accompany believers. They will use the power and authority of my name to force demons out of people. And they will speak with new languages. They're gonna speak in tongues. There's gonna be evidence that their life has been transformed. Well, that's that's Brother Mark. Let's find out what brother, Brother Luke said. Brother Luke said it this way. He said, and now I will send the Holy Spirit. This is Jesus in his last sermon saying to them, I will now send you the Holy Spirit just as my father promised, but you stay here in the city until. Somebody say until. In other words, Jesus was saying to them, don't try this by yourself. Don't do this alone. You stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you, what? With power. Somebody shout power. Power from on heaven. 
Then Jesus led them to Bethany, lifted his hands to heaven, and he blessed them. And as he was blessing them, he went on to heaven. Do you know what Jesus told his disciples? He said, it is better for you that I go away. It's better for you that I go away. Now, we live in a church world right now where everybody believes that Jesus, if you have Jesus, you have everything you need. But listen to me closely. The Bible teaches it this way. Jesus came to reveal the Father. He didn't come to reveal himself. He came to reveal the Father. You have to remember, Jesus is the door. No, I ain't got no help. Jesus is not the room. He's the door. He's the avenue into something else. God had to have a doorway to get mankind from a place where they live by their own power into a place where they could live by God's power. And Jesus said, I'm the door. I'm the door into that holy place, that sanctuary where God lives. Now watch this. And he said, it's better for me to go away. And the reason I'm going to go away is if I go away, why was it better for Jesus to go away? I like Jesus. Come on, everybody, help me. Why is it better for Jesus to go away? Because Jesus could only be in one place at one time. If Jesus was in Capernaum, he couldn't be down in Bethlehem. And if he was in Bethlehem, he couldn't be at Caesarea Philippi. He could only be in one place at one time. He said, so I can't be everywhere. I can't be with you when you're at work on Thursday. Not if I'm with Lauren, because I could only be in one place at one time. I ain't got no help. I'm going to preach over here. So he said, rather than leave you like an orphan, rather than leave you like somebody don't have any help, somebody who's trying to make it on your own, somebody who's trying to get there by your own willpower, he said, rather than leave you like an orphan and leave you helpless, God, my father is going to send another one just like me. And when he comes, he's going to lead you into all truth. Because here's what happens. Jesus came to reveal the Father. The Father promised he'd send the Spirit. Jesus got back to heaven so the Spirit could come. He said, I, he can't come till I get back. When I get back, he'll come. And when he comes, he'll teach you everything you need to know. So here's how you look at redemption's plan. Here's redemption's plan. And by the way, redemption is to redeem the whole world. He wants to redeem your neighborhood. If I got, if I got permission to stretch you a little bit today, will you give me just five more minutes to stretch you a little bit? How many of you realize that Everybody's like, I, want, I can't wait to get to heaven. I can't wait to get to heaven. I want to get to heaven. Do you know where you're going for eternity? Right here. Some of you just wanted a refund. You're like, I, I got it. I don't like Oklahoma City. No, no. He said, what's going to happen is because of redemption's work, God is now going to create a new heaven and a new earth. He's going to redeem everything that was lost. Come on. He's going to redeem it all. Watch this. Because Oklahoma City don't belong to the devil. You want to know why we have, you want to know why we've yielded universities to secular humanists? Because we don't believe we're going to be here. My Aunt Tini, I love her with all my heart. She's four foot 11, prayed for me every day of her life. At 82, dying, laying on her deathbed. She said, I thought I'd live to see the rapture. She's been dead over 30 years. Spent her whole life saying, I'm getting out of here. I'm leaving today. Jesus is going to come today. We had everything that gave the signs for it. Then all of a sudden, when Mikhail Gorbachev showed up, he had to be the false prophet because he had a mark on his forehead. Found out they had a machine, a computer in Belgium called the Beast. 
had everybody in the world's name in it. That's it. We're gone. We're out of here. Hmm? You want to know what happened? Christians quit living to see the earth redeemed and they started living to go to heaven. Oh, I realize I have just robbed some of you of your Christian joy completely, but listen to me. How many of you know he cares about your neighborhood? He cares about the school your children go to. He cares about the city you live in. He cares about the nation we dwell in. He cares about the continent I live on. He cares about the world that belongs to him because Psalms 24 says this, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So watch this, the father willed redemption. It was the father's will that everything that was lost be redeemed. It's God the father's will for every person in this building who's lost to be redeemed. The father willed it, the son accomplished it. Because in order for redemption to be realized, the price had to be paid to satisfy the penalty of sin. For without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Sin can't be removed until blood was shed. So the father willed it. The son accomplished it. And the spirit applies it. The spirit is the one who makes the work of redemption applied in your life so you live out what Jesus came to accomplish. Am I helping anybody? Let me do one more and I'm going to go. We're going to go home. He said, don't leave here until. See, we're content today to come and pray a prayer at an altar with a preacher. Come on. Something moves me in a service. I come down, I pray a 30-second prayer, give my life to Christ, and then I hold on until Jesus comes and gets me. Either Either by way of the grave or by way of the sky. Hmm? And we call that Christianity in America. In the Bible, there was no such terms as, are you a Christian? That that, that actually happened in the book of Acts, and it was used as a term of, a derogatory term towards people. In the Bible, when people were called Christians, it was derogatory. People were mocking them. Jesus used these terms, followers, disciples. How many of you would at least acknowledge with me there's a lot of people that prayed that ain't following? Mm, I I ain't feel no love right there. Let me try that one more time. A lot of people prayed, they just not following. And they have no power to know how to be discipled. So what we get is an insurance ticket to make sure I don't burn in hell. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to me whether I, whether I represent Jesus or not. I just don't want to go to hell. So I, this is what happened to me on Friday. I put this series off. I was going to preach it in the fall. And God said, no, I want you to move it forward. Because it's going to be a summer to remember. We're going to be summer strong. I called the office and starting the 23rd of June, I think it's the 23rd of June, I just said, we're going to go, we're going to pull all the congregations together into one service and we're going to go for eight weeks and I'm going to pour into the life of this church and the power of God's going to show up. That's not because, listen, my children's workers are already trying to figure out how to make that happen because it's going to overflow our kids department, our nursery department, but I believe this building is going to be filled and the power of God's going to fall on this building. Because God's going to fall on people's lives. Hmm? But here's what I know. 
Here's what I know. I'm sitting in my hotel room and the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, America is filled with Christianity light. It tastes great. It's just less filling. And it's more about me and less about him. And we've turned church pews into places for consumers. And everybody comes and makes sure they got their ticket into eternity and they're getting their blessing for the week and they feel better about themselves. And watch this, watch this. And we end up, we end up mimicking Jesus, never manifesting him. Anybody can act. Yes, come on. Come on. And I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, we have churches full of actors. And it doesn't show up until you get in the pressure points. I read a story about a guy that was, they, they, they had, a, they had a, an ape in a, in, a, in a zoo that died. And the ape used to swing out over all the lions and stuff and entertain all the people at the zoo. And so they didn't know what they was going to do because a whole big crowd of people was coming to watch the ape swing out over all the lions. And so a guy agreed that he would put on an ape suit and he would swing out over the lions because he thought, I can do that. I'm pretty athletic. And the first two or three shows he did, everybody was clapping and thought that was wonderful. And all of a sudden he was doing great until his rope broke. And how many of you know at that point in time, he came out of his ape suit? <laughs> See, what I'm discovering is this. I'm discovering that there's a lot of people going in church and they're going through the motions and they're playing their games and they're acting their part. But all of a sudden, when hell breaks loose on Tuesday at their house or something happens at a doctor's office or something happens unexpectedly, our ape suit comes off and we got to go, wait a minute. I got to not just mimic Jesus. I got to start manifesting the life of God in who I am. I wish somebody would help me in the building today. I said, God, when I'm finished at the gate this summer, we're either going to have a house full of people on fire for God or we won't have nobody left because I am on a mission that we are going to see the Holy Ghost and power. We're going to see people move into a dimension of living that gives them the ability to overcome devils, to break alcohol, to be free from sin, to live a victorious life. I don't, I, I'm out of time. I'm out of time. I'll close with this story. Come on, guys. See, when Jesus in Acts chapter 1, when Luke records Acts chapter 1, he said this. He reminds the disciples of his instruction. Somebody say instruction. I'll pick this up next week. The Holy Spirit was not an option. We've developed that in our Western theology. Jesus didn't come to his disciples and say, Peter, I realize you're raised Methodist and you don't believe in this, so you don't need it. That's okay. And Thaddeus, I, I realize you were Church of Christ and they don't believe in speaking in tongues, so you, you're excused. You're fine. You're fine. Or... John, you were Catholic. Your mother, you know, Mary, take care of Mary. So you don't need the Holy Spirit either. He didn't say that. He said, here's my instruction. Don't you leave here. Until. Until. Do, do you know... No, I, I, I'm not trying to make fun of anybody. I'm, please, that's not my heart at all. And I'm not trying to cast stones at anybody. I just want to say this. This is, this is a theological fact. There is not a writer in the New Testament that didn't pray in tongues. Not one. 
Matthew was a disciple. He was in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. He fell out in the street praying in tongues. Mark was a disciple of, 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 of Barnabas and Paul and they taught him and taught him about the gospel and he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Luke was on Paul's ministry team. He too was filled with the Holy Spirit when the outpouring fell in Antioch. John was a disciple. He was in the upper room when the Holy Spirit fell. Oh, and by the way, guess what? Mary was there. Mary, the mother of Jesus. She wasn't an idol saying, you can pray to me. Mary, the mother of Jesus said, I got to have the Holy Ghost. If I don't have the Holy Ghost, I can't do what God's called me to do. There were no people in the New Testament that were not spirit-filled people. I'm saying in America, it's time to bring an end to Christianity light. It's time for full strength gospel preaching. It's time for the power of the Holy Ghost. It's time that at your house on Monday night and Friday night and Thursday afternoon, the power of God resides within you. And when you face a battle, you don't get overtaken by fear and intimidation. The Holy Ghost in you rises up. You become what God intended you to be. Hey, I trust this word today just blessed your life. I hope there was something that enlarged you uh, and created faith to come alive on the inside of you. I'm always grateful for people who join us. Let me encourage you to do a couple of things. First of all, if you haven't followed me on social media, would you do that? Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, go look right now at Tony Miller TV. It's at Tony Miller TV on all formats. And you can follow and be up to date with things that we're doing. I'd love for you to invite your friends. Also go to my website, TonyMiller.tv for all the things that are coming to your area near you very, very soon. Once again, thanks for joining us today. Thank you.